some people have said that uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, in France and uh, and Rishi Sunak here in the UK are similar personalities because both are called elitist and arrogant towards the public. Would you agree? There are similarities. Both of them are. Uh, well, the, both of them have a financial background. They both worked in for the financial industry. They're both quite out of touch with ordinary people. They come across as arrogant and elitist, and they're technocratic in a way. But the, there are big differences as well. I mean, Macron is a man who thinks hugely about the future of Europe. He's got big ideas on where the EU should go and how to reform it. While Rishi Sunak is only interested in really economics. He's a bean counter, as we say in colloquial English. He's, he's almost like an accountant. He, he pours over the books and adds up the money, adds up the sums and has no great interest in foreign policy or defence or strategic affairs. So he's not a big thinker like Macron. What will change towards the uh, UK policy uh, towards Europe uh, after Labour comes into government? Well, I don't think they've got a very clear plan on what they want to do. They want a better relationship with the EU, they want a closer relationship, but they don't have as yet a kind of strongly developed plan in, the, in their pocket they're going to pull out. I think they will try and certainly to start with go for what's called a security pact there's a closer cooperation on foreign policy and defense because the eu wants that given the big bad dangerous world in which we live and that's okay for the uk it's not too politically controversial more collaboration on defense and foreign policy in addition to the security pact they'll also i think in the long run want to revisit the economic relationship because rather the trade deal that boris johnson negotiated the so-called trade and cooperation agreement is rather a bad deal for the uk economy it creates a lot of barriers at the border, which makes it hard for manufacturers to export to the EU and indeed for importers to import from the EU. So I think they're going to try and improve the terms of the trade deal. That's very difficult, though, because the EU rather likes the current deal it's got. It's good for the EU. When I talk to EU officials and European governments, they say to me, well, we like the deal as it is. We're very busy with a lot, a lot, a lot of other subjects on our plate. Um, so we're not going to be very enthusiastic if... Keir Starmer wants to reopen the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, but I think he's, he's going to have to because the current deal is so bad for the British economy. But when it comes to UK attitude towards Ukraine and support for Ukraine, will that change? There'll be no change in support for Ukraine because the Labour Party under Keir Starmer is very Atlanticist, very much taking a hard line on Russia, strong support for Ukraine, str belief in increasing defence expenditures, so that's not going to change. The, the British people are pretty much united in the support for Ukraine, with some outliers like Nigel Farage, the leader of the Reform Party, who is slightly sympathetic to Russia, a bit like Marine Le Pen is sympathetic to Russia. But mainstream politicians of all the main parties are very tough on Russia and very much behind helping Ukraine. So that will not change? I'm quite sure with the Labour government there'll be no change in support for Ukraine. It'll, it won't change, it'll just be the same amount of support as it is already. Is Keir Starmer more inspiring than Rishi Sunak? Well, I know Keir Starmer personally, which I don't, and I don't know Richie Sunak personally. I can, Keir Starmer is not a, an inspiring or charismatic guy, but he's decent, he's ordinary, he's honest, he's a, he's a regular kind of guy. I think nobody is particularly enthusiastic about him, but they recognise that he's honest and hardworking and you know what you get with him. He's, 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 he's never going to be a charismatic leader like Tony Blair was 25 years ago, but he's, he hasn't made any serious mistakes so far. And he's, he has done one thing very well, which is to purge the Labour Party of the hard left elements and make it electable. That's a huge achievement. He may not, he, he's not very popular if you ask people do they like him. They don't really like him very much, but he's made the Labour Party electable and nobody's scared of voting Labour. Well, they were with Jeremy Corbyn. They were scared of what would happen if you voted Labour. Nobody's, nobody thinks Labour's going to introduce Soviet-style socialism overnight now. If we're speaking about the French elections, do you think Emmanuel Macron overplayed his hand by calling those elections early? Well, I kind of sympathise with him because I think he was trying to do the best for France. He, he thought that if he waited till the autumn, he would probably going to lose a motion of no confidence in the autumn, in which case he would have to call elections then. And, but he wanted to go early at a time of his own choosing and wrong foot the left in particular and, and, the, and the Rassemblement National on the far right and get the advantage by kind of throwing the, throwing the dice and seeing what happened. But the gamble hasn't paid off. I think he overestimates his own powers of charisma and persuasion and his own intelligence, his ability to persuade people to support him. It hasn't really worked. What he doesn't, I think, appreciate is that a lot of people in France really can't stand Macron. They can't stand him. They're, he's very arrogant and stuck up and elitist. So there's a strong desire to get rid of Macron, despite the fact that he's actually managed the French economy quite well. Unemployment has come down. Inflation has come down. There are many worse economies than the French economy, but nobody gives him any credit for that. So I think he, his gamble is probably not paying off. But it, 
we still don't know about the long-term outcome. I mean, it may be if, if there is a uh, Rassemblement National government for two and a half, three years, and then uh, it makes a mess of things and doesn't govern France very well, then the far right may lose the next presidential election in 2027, in which case Macron will be sort of justified. But the trouble is it's, it's a, a roller coaster of a ride for the EU and for France but for the next two or three years, because a Rassemblement National government could do a lot, lot of damage to the EU if France, which is a central country, starts misbehaving and stops paying money into the EU budget, the EU will be in crisis and will get distracted from dealing with Ukraine, for example. The other out possible outcome is a hung parliament, where nobody has a majority. That seems to be, at the time of we're talking, the most likely outcome. It's very hard to say what that does to French politics, because we don't know, there will there be a technocratic government, will there be a government of, of national unity? And how, how that plays out in terms of Macron gaining support or losing support and the, and the far right losing or gaining support, we just don't know. So a lot of uncertainty. He's rolled the dice. It doesn't look like it's working, but there's still, still possible to imagine outcomes that are not so bad for Macron. In my part of the world, the, the main question, of course, is what's going to happen with the support for Ukraine? If Jordan Bardella becomes a prime minister of France, will that change uh, France's attitude towards Ukraine and towards Russia? I think it will change it to some degree. I, I spent some time with Mrs Le Pen uh, in an evening debate 12 years ago, and from what she said to me then, she's clearly quite sympathetic to Russia. However, she knows that if she comes out with two pro-Russian alliances, she will lose support, so she's being very careful about what she says, and Bardella is also being very careful. They say they will maintain French support for Ukraine, but not give it offensive weapons and not give the kind of weapons that can be used against Russia. If that's the case, that's maybe not disastrous for Ukraine. But one wonders where they're really coming from. I fear that in practice, Bardella and Le Pen may think a bit like Viktor Orban thinks, which is really there needs to be a peace deal. That means Ukraine has to start trading territory sooner rather than later with the Russians for a peace deal. So we, we, all we can say is we just don't know. I fear, I fear that it may not be good for Ukraine, but it may be that Bardella's got enough common sense to see that he's gonna, he wants to have other fights with the EU, and if he fights his allies on Ukraine as well, that's one fight too many. He may be, like Maloney, has turned out to be quite responsible on Ukraine, fairly responsible, and so, so and not, not want to get into a conflict with the Americans and the Europeans and the British on that particular issue, but we just don't know. I, I, I don't know how much of Bardella is a true believer in Le Pen's ideology and her undoubtedly pro-Russian ideology. I'm not sure about that, whether he's a bit different and a bit more sensible, a bit more moderate or not. We just don't know at the moment. But how much does a French prime minister has an influence on, let's say, France's support for Ukraine? Isn't that the president's prerogative? Well, influence is split between the president and the prime minister. Obviously, in theory, under the constitution of the Fifth French Republic, the president is in charge of defence and foreign policy and the, and the grand picture of European policy. The trouble is the prime minister is in charge of the budget and, and legislation and spending money. So if France wants to give, if the president wants to give money to Ukraine, it has to be voted by the parliament. So if the prime minister controls the parliament and the prime minister doesn't want to give money to Ukraine, there isn't any money for Ukraine. So the diplomacy is handled by the president, but the money comes from, and the legislation comes from the prime minister. So that in practice, there'd have to be a kind of compromise or concordat between the Elysee and the Matignon. So there's going to be a year of changes in UK, in uh, France, and also in the United States. I think... The United States is, is perhaps the most worrying place of all because if, if Le Rassemblement National do take power in France either this year or in a couple of years' time and we have Viktor Orban in power in Hungary, Mr Fico in power in Slovakia, the government in the Netherlands with the far-right PVV partly in power there and Italy with Maloney, who's turned out to be more reasonable than we thought, but is still potentially a problem, and then Trump takes office in the White House. That's, serious, that's a very serious situation indeed, because Trump in the White House may inspire other European governments to lean more to the far right. For example, it could push Maloney, who so far has been quite reasonable and moderate in her foreign policy, to, to, to veer back to her neo-fascist origins, where she comes from. If Trump, because Trump is, could be, the Americans are always powerful and influential, whatever they're doing. So I think there's a danger that there's a kind of Orban Trump axis in which other countries start to join. Then the EU ends up split down the middle with sort of two thirds taking a more moderate stance and one third taking a far right stance. And that's not good for the EU's ability to support Ukraine against Russia. But apart from Ukraine, is that so bad that the whole world shifts towards the right? 
Well, apart from Ukraine, but I think Ukraine is very important. Uh, I think in other respects too, it does matter if Europe shifts to the, to, to the far right, because it can't enlarge. That's different from the issue of helping Ukraine in its war. The far right is against EU enlargement because EU enlargement means more migration, more immigration, more cost to the EU t taxpayers, paying for farm support, paying for regional aid, more contributions to the EU budget. So the far right is always against enlargement. So the idea that the Western Balkans, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia could ever join the EU will, I think, be stopped. That idea will be blocked if the far right do well in many European countries. So that is one reason why it matters. The other reason it matters is they're against green, green policies as well. They don't care about climate change. Many of them don't believe that climate change is a problem. So the EU's efforts to combat climate change will be blocked by the growth and support for the far right. So it's not just Ukraine that is at stake here. It's, it's green issues, it's migration, it's EU institutional reform, it's enlargement as well. Thank you. So much. Thank Thank you. you.